Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Bhupendra Saha, Fellow Clinical Neurology, Department of Neuroscience, Grand International Hospital, and also Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine, BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences. Today, we'll discuss about the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. So the disclosure is I'm a clinical fellow of neuroscience. I do not have had any, any conflict of interest. And I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Raju Podil, Dr. Lixung Thapa, my colleague, Dr. Noli Manandar, and my uh, own beloved brother, uh, technician, Dr. Mr. Loxman Timil Senadai. So what we are going to discuss today in this CME. So I would like to share the story of our patient who have progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Then after we'll be discussing on approaching the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. For that, when to suspect the progressive myoclonic epilepsy, then classification of it, then the clinical feature of the two common progressive myoclonic epilepsy, that is unburic Lundborg disease and Lafora body disease. Then in the last, we'll briefly discuss about approaching to progressive myoclonic epilepsy. So case history of our patient is, the my patient is, was 16 year, he was from the far western part of the Nepal, who presented to our neuroscience OPT, along with his father with complaints of multiple episodes of Zorki movement for one year, which aggravated and sound on touching the patient. And there was the and it get relieved on sleeping. There is also history of the progressive cognitive deterioration. That was the one of the main reason why he was brought to our setting. And there is also associated history of irritability, anger, brost, and multiple episodes of generalized tonic clonic seizure in my patient. On further elaborating the history in the, in, the, in the family, he has the elder brother who had similar episodes of Zarki movement that started at the age of 13. Now his brother was 20 years and he, he had also the multiple episodes of the Zanlai's tonic clonic seizure and he visited nearby hospital in Lucknow where he was treated by anticonvulsant therapy. And the treatment history of my patient was, he was treated with multiple anticonvulsant and he, he responded partially with those anticonvulsants. So on examining the patient in the, our neuroscience OPD, my mentor, Dr. Raj Bodil, called me and showed me the case. And when I saw the case, he, he was uh, on the wheelchair and he was throwing the jerky, sorry, jocks of the movement, and that was myoclonus. On, on clapping the patient, he again threw the sudden myoclonic jerk. And even on touching, there was myoclonic jerk. And that was the history of the patient since last one year, and an MMSC calculation, his MMSC was 18 by 13, showing that there is also the cognitive deterioration of the patient. So this was the video of our patient, the yellow, the one who is wearing the yellow T-shirt is our patient, uh, who was uh, not showing any myoclonic jerk, and the gray 
t-shirt wearing guy was his elder brother let's look at the video we can notice the, some injury marks over the knee of my patient because of the multiple episodes of the fall or this type of jerk Okay, so you can see the job. So we did the EZ of our patient after admission. We saw there is a spike waves in the slow background. The spikes are coming from the bifrontal region. And there is near about the heart of this spike wave is near about around Four to six near about four three to four hearts yes and the 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 there is a spike sweep throughout the all the layers saying there is the epileptiform discharge coming from the all parts of the brain so you also did the mri brain with spectroscopy which was normal And we made a diagnosis of the provisional diagnosis of progressive myoclonic epilepsy, uh, probably Lafora-Barre disease. And we discharged him on Falfrate 800 MGBD, levatiracetam, topiramide, and the clonazepam. He responded well to our the treatment, and the patient sent video after 8 to 15 days of our treatment. He comes. In our follow-up, and there was decrease in the episodes of the myoclonus. We did the skin biopsy, but from the axillary region, and try to see the Lafora body disease, but there was no Lafora body disease in the skin biopsy. So, so still, uh, with all the symptom matching regarding the onset of the disease at the age of 13, progressive cognitive deterioration, Similar history in the elder brother, uh, probably this might be the case of Lafora body disease. So this is the very, very sad story of our patient. So if we see this type of patient without proper knowledge, then most of the time we may treat definitely treat the epilepsy part, seizure part, but we tend to consider that myoclonus at some form of the functional component. Okay, that is why we need to think about the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. So when to suspect the progressive myoclonic epilepsy? The one important history is family history like in our patient <clears throat> because most of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy <clears throat> patient <clears throat> runs some has an autosomal dominant, some has an autosomal recessive pattern. So if there's a family history, then <clears throat> definitely that is the one of the strongest clue towards the diagnosis of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Regarding the age of the onset, so progressive myoclonic epilepsy is the disease of the child. If you see this type of myoclonic epilepsy in the elderly people, then the differentials are different. Like it may be because of the CZD or Lewy body dementia. Okay. So the so this, if the if there any child presented with this myoclonic epilepsy, then then we need to think about progressive myoclonic epilepsy. And the the progressive myoclonic epilepsy, the disease of the cortex. So there is the cortical myoclonic epilepsy, and you, as you know, the feature of the cortical myoclonus usually it is uh, responsive are stimulated by touch, sound, or light. And it gets usually relieved on sleep. That's the feature of the cortical myoclonic. If someone, there is a decrease in the myoclonic episode on sleeping, then that's the cortical myoclonic epilepsy. 
may or may not be associated with the generalized epilepsy. And definitely there is a progressive neurological deterioration and some patient can have the ataxia. If there's a combination of these type of symptoms, like in our patient, the fam positive family history, young age of onset, cortical myoclonus, epilepsy, and progressive neurological deterioration, there is a combination of these uh, symptoms in our patient. That's why we thought of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy in our patient. Then what are the causes of this progressive myoclonic epilepsy? The names are difficult, but one is unburricht Lundborg disease. Second one is Lafora body disease. Myoclonic epilepsy with rat bracket fibers, it has mitochondrial inheritance, which is in short form, it is also called the MRF. Sialidosis, neuronal ceroid life efficiencies, neurosarpinosis, spinal muscle atrophy, and axon myoclonus renal syndrome. So let us see the evidence from our own setting. This study was done in the South India by Satish Chandra et al. We show the causes of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy, but they have shown the LVD and the NCL as one of the important cause of the uh, progressive myoclonic epilepsy. But if you see the old data, then definitely the ULD is the most common form of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy followed by the Lafora body disease. So let us discuss briefly about the unborrick Lundborg disease because it is the common, it is the less severe form and has a good prognosis than other type of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. It follows the it is autosomal recessive patterns and it, is, it, ha it has the mutation in cystitin B gene that is called EPM to A. And the age of onset is six to 15 years. The clinical co features of the unburdicked Lundborg disease is that there can be the myoclonus. As you know, it can be triggered by the accents and touching and sensory. And sometimes even with the stress, there can be the myoclonic episodes. There can be a history of the generalized seizure, but the interesting thing is that it decreases with age. And even the cognitive improvement with time, it is usually the photosensitive, and there can be the concomitant psychiatric comorbidities in patient. And they may have the normal lifespan. On doing the EAG, we can see the epileptic form discharge from all the leads and on the background of this flowing background. And the outcome of the onboard Lundborg disease is uh, most of the patient will have independent active life with minimum impairment to severe disability. The second is the Lafora body disease. It is that we have discussed. It is autosomal recessive conditions. The mutation occur in the EPM2A chromosome six, short term of the chromosome six, and the age of onset is eight to 19 years and the peak age of onset is 13 years. The clinical features are the myoclonic jerk, which can occur even in the waist and even on the axon. There can be the generalized seizure. It may be the generalized tonic or absence seizure. The visual hallucination is the typical feature of this Lavora body disease. They can have the cortical blindness. They can have the progressive dementia. And they can sometimes present in the status epilepticus. And there can be the concomitant psychosis, dysarthria, and the mutism. If we do the EEG of the patient with the Lafora body disease, then we can see the epileptic form discharge throughout the all the leads, and the heart is near about four, and the background is usually the slow. So if you do the MRI in a Lafora body disease, it's unremarkable to sometimes patient may have the atrophy and MRI spectroscopy may show the reduction in N-acetyl aspartate to creatinine ratio in frontal cortex, cerebellum, and the basal ganglia. On doing the skin biopsy from the region where there is a uh, abundant sweat gland, we can see this type of Lafora body. Okay. And the treatment wise, what we need to uh, 
do is that uh, we have to counsel the patient, patient, uh, patient attendant, uh, basically regarding the course of the disease um, and regarding the comorbidities that can present, uh, but regarding the safety issues of the patient and the effective treatments for the PME uh, is the valprate. Most of the time we give the valprate, uh, phenobarbitone, levatiracetam, topiramide, uh, zonisimide, and penampamil. Uh, but the thing that we, we, we have to think about the oxycarbamazepine and carbamazepine, carbapentine and pregabalin should not be given to a patient with the progressive myoclonic epilepsy because that can worsen the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Okay. So the last, let us see the approach. It was taken from the review article by Satishandra P. Atal. If you see any patient whom we are suspecting the progressive myoclonic epilepsy, the history of the myoclonic jerk and then the seizure. Then we have to ask the history properly. If someone has the dementia and the visual failure and the occipital seizure, which is which is sensitive to the lights, and the age of onset in the second decade, then we have to think about the Lafarabadi disease. In the patient with the NCL, there is a concomitant retinal degeneration and optic atrophy. That's why we need to check up, check the fundoscopic properly. In the onboric Lundborg disease, there is the cognition is usually the normal in later. There can be the ataxia and the course is usually the benign. In case of the morph, there can be the concomitant deafness. So if you get any patient with the progressive myoclonic epilepsy, then definitely we need to ask regarding the uh, sensor hearing loss, and there can be the concomitant neuropathy as well in the case of the mark. In case of TSEC disease, there can be the startle myoclonus and the cherry red spot. So in the clinically, even you can guess which type of the progressive myoclonic epilepsy is there in our patient. The second step is electrophysiology. Most of the time we do the EEG, uh, where you can see the diff, uh, like uh, epilepsy from discharge, and one test that we can perform is the uh, somatosensory evoc potential. Uh, as, it is, as it is a case of the uh, critical myoclonus, there can be the giant sensory somatosensory evoc potential we can elicit. In case of the morph, we get you the NCVs, then we can see the neuropathies. And in case of TSEC disease, there is the absent visual evoc potential. But we need to prove our diagnosis for that. We may need the help of pathology people, biochemical analysis, and genetics. For the, we can do the skin biopsy to diagnose the Lafora body disease and the NCL. And we have to do the muscle biopsy to diagnose the morph. And we have to also do the biochemical analysis to diagnose the NCL and the TSEC disease. And if possible, then we can send the uh, next generation sequencing to diagnose our patient genetically, where you can see uh, the evidence of the mutation in different types of the gene. So the, finally, the take home message is, if someone has the cortical myoclonus, it's progressive cognitive dysfunction in young age, that's are the clues for the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Unbarbaric Lundborg disease is the commonest, but usually less severe form, whereas Lafara body disease is usually the fatal. Valproate, levatiracetam, topiramide, and benzodiazepine are preferred anticonvulsant for managing progressive myoclonic epilepsy, whereas carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine, phenytoin, pregabalin, and the gabapentins are usually contraindicated in a patient with the progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention and the consultation.